Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I am attempting to stream in two places at once. <laughs> so here, when I'm looking this direction, this is Twitch. Um, I'm going to try to check the chat as best I can, but I'm one person. So it might be difficult to toggle between talking and looking at the chat, but I'll do my best. So if you have any questions, leave them in both chats. <laughs> if I look in this direction, I am looking at Instagram. So hi, Instagram. Um, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and put it in the comments. I might not get to all of them today because a lot of people submitted um, pantry questions for quarantine cooking. So I'll try to get through as much as I can um, today, but if I don't get to your question today, I'll save it for next week because I'm going to be going live every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Can you both hear me? So if you're in the chat on Twitch, please let me know if you can hear me. And on Instagram, can you tell me, can you hear me? Can you... Hi, Nat. Hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello, Seven Bean Salad. Oh my gosh, people are watching. Hi. So you both can hear me. This is great. Cool. Um, how many of you already know who I am? I'm Jen. Oh, the video is stuttering. Ooh. Don't know how to fix that. But you can hear me though, right? <laughs> what am I paying for, Verizon? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Okay, great. Instagram can hear me. Twitch can hear me. Video is being weird on Twitch. I, I'll try to fix that for next time. Um, but hello. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Jen De La Vega. I, this is so weird. I'm going to maybe switch between looking at each camera. Uh, <laughs> I am a wedding caterer slash office caterer slash any kind of caterer. Um, before this virus, I was going to people's offices and making them lunch. I was flying to Portland and catering weddings. Uh, I've been trying to live a bi-coastal lifestyle between Brooklyn and Oakland. Bro Brooklyn, <laughs> Oakland, <laughs> which is also a great album title from Alias and Tarzir, by the way, that you should check out. Anyway, um, I've been traveling between these two places and trying to ramp up catering business but with something like a worldwide pandemic it's been really tough to a get out of the house and get out of the city and out of the state um and continue what i'm doing so pretty much all my catering has been canceled until july which is really sad but i'm trying to make the most of it and help people figure out what to do in the kitchen especially if you're like a first time home cook like, it's totally okay, and um, that's why I'm here, to help you. So, it's really exciting. Um, there are a few things I want to get out of the way first. So, thank you to Baby Castles. Um, if you had come in to this stream via Baby Castles, I had an exhibit there two years ago, and um, they so graciously volunteered to co-host my stream. So, if you see me from Baby Castles, hello. Um, this is not, like... I don't know, a non sequitur connection. Like, uh, I make a lot of food art, um, I'm not just a chef. So, uh, thank you for your support, Baby Castles. And you should check out their live streams. They're going to be playing games and fundraising for their space since they've had to close um, for the safety of the community. So, um, check out Baby Castles. They're here on Twitch. Um, second, I'm on Patreon. That's another way that I'm trying to make this creative life work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been doing like the cooking thing full time for two years and I've always wanted to, I don't know, uh, piecemeal all the weird projects that I have into one lifestyle. And so I've been doing it for the last two years. And um, I don't know, not being able to cater and cook for other people is a huge disruption for me. And so, 
I'm publishing four recipes a month on Patreon for just $2 subscriptions. There's a dollar subscription where you can um, download all of my cheese guides. I make a lot of infographics about how to cook with cheese, how to take care of cheese, how to eat it, um, as well as like what's happening in the cheese industry. So I don't know if you know this, but um, there's a lot happening besides, you know, the current <laughs> virus economy. Before that, um, cheese and wine has been going through like a terrible um, taxation. So the president um, started to penalize other countries um, for the price of jet fuel. And so cheese and wine is starting to, you know, take on a lot of tariffs and taxes. And so it's going to be harder and harder to export cheese to the U.S. Um, so, yeah, we're going to lose a lot of like French, Spanish, European cheeses, which is really sad. But on the other side of it, American cheese is doing really well. And if you want to read all about that, I have tons and tons of information on my Patreon. So it's patreon.com slash randwitches, um, which is my username, across all of the internet. So if you just Google randwitches or my name, you'll find all the stuff. Um, but Patreon is sort of how I'm going to try to make this work besides trying to freelance write for publications. So just yesterday, I published um, three easy nacho recipes on Thrillist. Uh, using things you might find at a bodega or pantry items you might already have, like evaporated milk, funyuns, wavy chips, pretzels, pickles, uh, and, uh, and mustard. Yeah, did you know cheese and mustard go together really well? So, now you know. Um, on top of all of this, I launched an Etsy store. I promise I'll start talking about food food in a minute, but I just want to get the business out of the way. Um, so I launched an Etsy store and I'm selling dry goods, um, specifically salt blends that will help you, I don't know, make your food less boring. Because if you just stocked up on tons of beans, like they're gonna get really tiring really quickly. So um, I have spice blends that I make, or you can like take the ideas from my Etsy store and make them yourself. Um, so some of them here are like fish rub. You can see that here, that fish rub got barbecue rub this is good for roasts barbecue rub um buttermilk ranch i have a lot of this stuff like i bought a bulk bag of buttermilk powder and so i've been making my own hidden valley ranch condiment you know uh so mine has tarragon chives onion garlic and pepper um you can mix this in the sour cream, you can put it in oil as a dip, you can um, put chicken in it and uh, bread it and then deep fry that. So you have already like pre-flavored chicken tenders, which is very, very exciting. Um, but yeah, ranch powder. If you look at the Hidden Valley Ranch like website, they have so many recipes for what you can do with it. You know, I ain't above that. I love it. Um, I also have Gen Mai Cha salt. Um, you might know matcha salt or matcha tea. Um, Gen Maicha has roasted rice cut into it. Um, so this is more of like a toasty green tea salt, which is very exciting. Um, yeah, did you know you can have tea as a condiment and not just as a drink? <laughs> pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, what else, what else? I've got rye berries. I don't know if you've ever had rye berries. They're... They've still got the hull on them. They're a lot like barley, but chewier and have this lovely toasty smell. It's related to einkorn. It's where we get rye bread, where we get, you know, rye liquors. Uh, so you can cook them like rice and eat them. And the beautiful thing about them is you don't have to like mix, you don't have to like measure you know how you, when you make rice, you have to have like two to one, like a water ratio. But for rye berries, you can just keep boiling them with the X amount of water and then drain it like pasta. So you don't have to measure so hard. Mm, yeah, because measuring is hard. I, for me, I think it is. Oh, hello to everybody in the Twitch chat. Oh my gosh, Josh, Baby Castles, Carol. Oh, I'm so excited to see all of you. <laughs> this is so cool. 
I'm going through um, my Etsy supply and showing people what we have in stock first. Oh, and if you order from me, I also am including um, all of these cheese labels that I got from working at a cheese shop. I'll show you over here too. So I have all these vintage cheese labels that I put on um, sticker paper. So everybody who orders from my Etsy store will get one. Or um, somebody was telling me they want the cheese labels and not the salt. So maybe I'll make a package of just cheese labels. I've got some really good ones like Brunei here from Alta Longa. Love this one. Look at this goat friend, man. Hi everybody on Instagram. For those of you that don't know, I have two cameras going at the same time, an Instagram stream and a Twitch. But so I'm gonna be turning every now and then to look at both. <laughs> okay. So those are cheese stickers. That's all about the Etsy store. You can see it down below um, on my Twitch page. I have it linked. So um, if you need to spice up your food, your pasta, your rice, your sugar cookies, you, you know, these are all things that you can use. Um, okay, so let's get to a food question first. My friend Ava asked about lentils. And it's really funny all the things that people have been asking me about this week. They're like ingredients that I haven't really stocked myself or haven't explored, you know, in depth, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, lentils are amazing, first of all. And I have a stack of cookbooks here that we're gonna go through <laughs> to talk about lentils. <laughs> so first up, we've got James Beard's American Cookery. I got this. Um, so James Beard over here, James Beard's American Cookery. I got this at Powell's in Portland, Oregon, and Powell's is one of the best bookstores. I don't have it. How many of you have been to Powell's? <laughs> I love it. It's one of the biggest bookstores ever, and <laughs> excuse me, their cookbook section is incredible. Like, this thing was like almost out of print <laughs> and I found a copy for $75, which is a lot for me to spend on a cookbook, but um, totally worth it. James Beard's a legend. So what he says in, um, so this is what James Beard says about lentils. They're supposed to be the mess of pottage that figures in the Bible. I have grave doubts that this is so, even though some French cookbooks list lentil soup as potage. However, they are indeed an ancient legume long favored as food in Asia and in Europe and introduced to America by immigrants from those continents. Uh, we do not grow the number of varieties that one finds in Europe or Asia, but we do have, but we, what we do have does exceptionally well. Some of the finest are grown in the West, blah, 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 blah. Um, lentils have become a much neglected dry vegetable. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I think mainly because people have not tasted them at their best. I think that's an argument for most vegetables in general. Um, they need complementary flavors to make them interesting, although they have a good earthy quality on their own. So this is what James Beard says about lentils. So for his first recipe about lentils, it says, um, bring to a boil in salted water along with onion and bay leaf. Simmer until they are just tender and then drain. And he says, be careful not to overcook lentils. Like, James Beard, this is not helpful at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> cook until they're just tender. <laughs> this man wrote a really thick cookbook <laughs> and cannot be bothered to tell you a cooking duration. Because, there's a reason for this, because lentils are so temperamental. Like, they can get super mushy really fast. And so... People who have tested this, like the kitchen, I'm gonna go over to that tab. Um, they say to saute, well, bring it to a boil and simmer for like rapid simmer for five to 10 minutes and then bring it down to medium low and simmer uncovered for 20 to 30. But check it like it's pasta, you know? Like whenever any recipe says check it, you know, between 20 and 30, always check it the first time. And then from there, like come back to it and watch, you know, every couple minutes I would 
you know, so if somebody said cook it for 20 to 30 minutes, I'm checking it at 20, 25, and then 30. Um, yeah. So going back to James Beard's first lentil recipe, he's got an onion stuck with two cloves. This is such like a European thing to like lodge like, ooh, sorry, I'm gonna turn that music off. <coughs> such a European thing to lodge cloves and onions. Like I haven't really seen that anywhere else. But he's got onion stuck with two cloves, a bay leaf, half pound slab of bacon, more onion. He has two onions in this recipe because I think one is just aromatic for saute for simmering the lentils and the other one is <laughs> for eating with the lentils. And then two garlic cloves, pepper and parsley. So that is James Beard's lentil recipe. I have a few others here. Okay, I've got another thick book. Before we, well, actually, let me just tell you all of James Beard's lentil applications. So he has a lentil salad with thyme, onion, olive oil, vinegar, pepper, and parsley. That sounds nice. Um, lentils maitre de hotel. This is a recipe from Delmonico's dating from 1885. You bring the lentils to a boil, add salt, simmer, simmer till they're just tender. <laughs> no time instruction. That means 20 to 30 minutes, I mean. You drain, and then you add butter, pepper, nutmeg, and parsley. It's really simple. Sounds pretty good. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not used to talking this much. Because I've just been like quietly sitting at my computer for like the last week. So, excuse me, I'm a little asthmatic. Um, let's see, what else? He has a lentil casserole with sausage. It, so far, the theme that I'm seeing with lentils is that um, fatty meats, so sausage and bacon, go really well with them. But if you're vegan, I would substitute, you know, coconut oil or, um, you know, other fatty proteins. Yeah. So lots of onion and lentil going together. Um, lentil puree. So once you've already cooked them, you know, have them on hand, throw them on the salad, throw them on the pasta, you know, that kind of thing. You can later puree them like it's a bean, like you can make a hummus. So their recipe, like James Beard's recipe is lentils, onion stuck with two cloves again. Oh my gosh, this is hilarious. Um, butter, mace, ginger, and heavy cream. Whoa, lentils and ginger sounds really good. Yum. And then Mrs. Rohrer's Egyptian lentils. Um, to be served with rice, uh, accompanied for grilled, grilled foods. Cool. So lentils, tomatoes, onion, mace, pepper, cardamom seeds, and butter. That sounds dope, y'all. All right, so those are the lentil options from James Beard's American cookery. If you ever want me to look up anything in this, let me know and I will check it out. Oh, thanks Carol for hosting my Twitch stream. Signal boost. That's very nice of you. All right, let's go to now Escoffier and see what he has to say about lentils. So Escoffier. I love going through cookbooks. This is what I did on Thanksgiving with my friend Emily. <laughs> While we were waiting for the turkey to finish, I was just like reading through cookbooks and being like, aha, you know? <laughs> All right, so Scoffier, um, let's see. This is a classic, classic French book. I studied this for maybe three years on my own instead of going to culinary school. <laughs> um, and let's see, I believe this was first published in 1846. So these are pretty outdated. Some of these tips might not be, you know, perfect. But let's see, when you flip to lentils, it says lentils are cooked as directed under the preparation of dry vegetables. It's weird that uh, he lumps in lentils with all the other dry vegetables. So that, I guess that means legumes, dried things. Okay, so let's, let's go to that page. I've already marked it here. <clears throat> this is what Escoffier says about the treatment of dry vegetables. It is wrong to soak dried vegetables. Yo, no, no, no. I totally disagree with you. <laughs> Beans should be soaked, guys. <laughs> anyway, um, 
If they are of good quality and the produce of the year, they need to be only put in a saucepan with enough cold water to completely cover them and with one ounce of salt per five quarts of water. Now I'm going to disagree with this Gauffier here. Um, a lot of research has shown that we don't really put the salt um, in any bean recipes or lentil recipes until after they've been you know, rightfully saturated and simmered for five to 10 minutes. It's because the salt can inhibit the water from going into the husk or the shell. So, you know, hold back on putting salt into your lentils or beans until they've already come to like a rigorous boil. Okay, so he says, set to boil gently, skim, add seasoning, quartered carrots, onions, with or without garlic cloves, an herb bunch, and set to cook gently with a lid on. Okay, it's really weird that there these both of these like legendary cookbooks have no cook times whatsoever. <laughs> but um, let's see remarks: If the vegetables used are old and inferior in quality, they might be put to soak in bicarbonated water. But this is only long enough to swell them slightly, about one and a half hours. So that's an interesting trick I haven't tested yet. So adding baking soda to soaking water. Cool. All right, let's try that. I feel like I've read that in a Notolenghi recipe to soak chickpeas in um, baking powder, but not baking soda. So maybe I'll, I'll delve into that another time. So a prolonged soaking of dried vegetables, they give rise to in, incipient germination, and this, by impairing the principles of the vegetables, depreciates the value of the food and may even cause some harm to the diner. So don't over-soak your lentils or beans. Yeah, Josh, soak them beans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that applies to a lot of things besides lentils. So we're going back to lentils. So these are the different ways that Escoffier says to uh, serve lentils. Um, buttered lentils. Carefully drain them after you've already cooked them for your 20 or 30 minutes. Dry them by tossing them over the fire. I, I don't think so. <laughs> we're gonna, I'm going to contend to this again. Um, so to dry and drain lentils, I would use, uh, you know, a sieve, I would use a colander, and then um, to rapid, you know, cool anything like that, uh, you get a baking sheet, you put uh, paper towels down, and you create more surface area. That is the way to dispel heat quickly. So if you have a bowl of lentils in a, in a colander just sitting there, it's so dense that none of that heat is going to, like, escape so the way you do it is spread it out onto a sheet pan and they'll they'll you know cool off quicker so that's that's a better way to do it um okay so buttered lentils toss them la 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 la, la. so once they're drained uh bind them with two ounces of butter per pound of lentils Ooh, sprinkle with chopped parsley so like butter and lentils sounds easy sounds good <laughs> all right um also suggests a puree of lentils easy it's kind of like making hummus you know any bean can become a, a dip or a hummus or a sandwich spread so you know take uh two cups of uh cooked lentils or cooked chickpeas or cooked beans drain them um mash them with a garlic clove and then enough olive oil to make it saucy and dippy so this is wonderful um, this next recipe is called Veronique. Oh, interesting. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not lentils at all. <laughs> it's called Veronica. Veronica. I don't know what that means. I'm going to have to look it up. Anyway, we're talking about lentils. So that was Escoffier. This is a book that I studied for a long, long time. Here. <laughs> and it's... Um, it has a lot about the mother sauces, basic French cooking. It doesn't have any pictures. It's all text. It's like paragraph form. But I learn better this way. I, I'm sort of like a dense reader. Um, and I learn by doing. So I don't know. I prefer it. But if you don't prefer that um, and you need pictures, Jacques Pepin has great tutorials both online and in book form. All right. Let's see. I feel like there's one more lentil that we can look up here. This is all for Ava. Ava, talking about lentils for you. Um, this is from the Salad for President cookbook. This is Julia Sherman's book. Uh, this collection is 
inspired by artists, like fine artists. Um, she went around and interviewed so many people about salad and the vegetables they eat and what they do in their studios. And so it's pretty wonderful. Um, her lentil recipe, let's see. Uh, kale and beluga lentil salad with warm bagna cauda dressing. So this, this is pretty decadent and wonderful, but uh, check it out. Lovely, 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 lovely. Okay, so make the salad. Rinse and pick through the lentils to remove any stones. So with any bean-like thing, any lentils, anything that comes like in a bulk bag, pick through it for rocks. <laughs> this can happen to you. You can bite into a rock and hurt your teeth. Um, so the best way that I've found to sift through um, beans is to, again, get your friendly kitchen sheet pan, lay it all out, and just, you know, just uh, run your fingers through it and look for rocks. And just keep an eye out for it when you're cooking. Um, it can happen. But, uh, you know, just cursory look. Just kind of move around with your hands on a sheet pan, and then you're like, okay, no, rock, no rocks, great. Um, so she says to simmer with a bay leaf and stock for 15 to 25 minutes uh, from a boil and down to a simmer. So that, that kind of lines up with the, the kitchen's advice, which was 20 to 30. So again, I would start checking the lentils for doneness at 15 and then every couple minutes uh, check. Um, and then drain them in a sieve. Great, great, great. She has a salad here with uh, kale parsley, lovage, or celery seeds if you can't find lovage. And then for the bagna cauda, which is a typically a warm fondue dip, it's half butter, half uh, olive oil, pepper flake, uh, lemons, and mashed up anchovy. So it's fishy and umami bomb and wonderful. So um, that's the dressing for this salad. So kale, lentil, bagna cauda dressing. Whoa, y'all. Cool. So those are some of the lentil recipes that I found here. I have so many books that like, I could go through, um, but I think the takeaway here is lentils act a lot like beans and they can go over very quickly. They can get really mushy. Um, people don't prefer them mushy, but if they do, you know, if you get stuck with some mushy lentils, turn it around, you know, like add some heavy cream, make it a really decadent dip. Um, whip in some cream cheese. Like, there are so many ways you can save it. Uh, so, yeah, lentils. That was all for you, Ava. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna mark it off on my list here that we talked about that. We talked about salts. Um, do, 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 talked about this, talked about this, talked about this. Wow, okay. What time is it? Okay, it's 5.28. We've done almost 30 minutes of the stream. I'm really glad and grateful that you're here. Hello, hi everyone. Um, okay, the next thing that somebody asked about was chia seeds, which is another thing admittedly that I don't use <laughs> or don't have. I've eaten them a few times and um, they're kind of like aliens, right? <laughs> like, what do you guys like to do with chia seeds? I know that you're supposed to soak them for 10 minutes and a lot of overnight porridges um, use chia seeds. So, oh, hi Robert. <laughs> We're about to talk about chia, uh, chia seeds. So in the Tartine All Day Cookbook, which is this, beautiful, support Tartine, Tartine All Day. Chia pudding, yes, yes, yes. Chia pudding is one thing you can do with it. So this is a banana bread with streusel topping. Um, so chia seeds are not only rich in omega fatty acids, but they're also hygroscopic, which means that when exposed to water, the seeds immediately hydrate, absorbing many times their volume and turning gelatinous. Because of this property, they're often used as a replacement for eggs in vegan recipes. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, to grind chia seeds, use a coffee grinder. Um, because they contain high amounts of fat, process for only a few seconds so the seeds do not become a paste. So, hi Don! <laughs> How do you get chias to not clump? I don't know. Uh, it says here, one tablespoon of chia seeds per three tablespoons of water. So, takeaway for everyone, chia seeds are a three to one proportion 
tablespoon. Okay, so three to one water to chia seed, soaking, soaking. So in a small bowl, mix the chia seeds in water. Let sit for 10 minutes for the seeds to soften. That's really quick. That's pretty cool. Whoa. This is, I'm learning a lot just <laughs> from, from all of this. So what do we do with the chia seeds in a banana bread? Um, mix in the sour cream. Oh, okay, so they go in in the later part of the recipe. So if you're making a regular banana bread recipe, right before you're about to bake everything and you've mixed in all your liquids, that's when you would fold in chia seeds for more texture. That's cool. It's kind of, they act like poppy seeds, like in a poppy seed muffin. Yeah. So that's from the Tartine All Day um, cookbook. That's just like one takeaway about chia seeds. So pudding is another thing you can do with them. Let's see what we've got here. Chia seeds and everything you need to know. Oh, they're a flowering plant in the mint family known as Salvia Hispanica, native to Mexico and Guatemala. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah, they kind of remind me of um, tapioca because they have that, you know, gelatinous outside. So besides soaking them in water for 10 minutes, uh, you can bake with them after they've been hydrated, which is great. Um, and then after that, you can put them on parfaits. You can have them with cut fruit. You can drink them like tapioca, <laughs> which is cool. Um, how to get them to not clump? I think you add more water and just keep jostling them because it, it's like um, pasta. So if you've never stirred the pasta after you've poured it in, they're all going to just um, stick to each other. So I think as soon as you get it into a container with liquid, stir them up and hopefully they won't stick. Ha, 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 ha. Um, let's see. Does anyone have any questions so far in the chat about cooking or, you know, how you doing? How you doing? I'm gonna take a drink of water. Do you like my pizza? Oh, you can't see it over here, but um, I have a pizza on the wall behind me. <laughs> How is everybody on Instagram doing over there? What is everybody drinking? I'm drinking water. <laughs> okay. So a fun thing that I'm doing, so besides this stream, is that I have a living pantry guide on Patreon and it's free. And I've listed pretty much all of the recipes I've written um, for free and on Patreon um, by ingredients. So all you have to do is hit um, Command F, Apple F, Control F, and search the page for those ingredients. And um, you'll be able to see what I've done with it in the past. And if you have a request for things for me to add, I can add it to the to the living resource and uh, you can learn from it. And hopefully we all will have, you know, uh, lots of food and can use everything to its fullest potential. Okay, we got some questions from the Twitch chat. Uh, Dawn says, Jen, I have frozen bones in my freezer and think it's been there for more than a year, maybe two. Can I still use those for bulalo? So for those of you who don't know what bulalo is, it's this amazing, Filipino comfort soup that it's um, mostly made with beef bones, cabbage, marrow, uh, what am I forgetting, onions. I've made it so many times. Let me see. I, I want to double check. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah! I, I wrote an article for Taste um, about the history of the spoon in the Philippines. And with that, I shared a recipe for bulalo. Oh yeah, so what else? So beef shank, yellow onion, peppercorn, bay leaf, garlic, corn, bok choy, cabbage, and then having rice to eat with it. It's pretty wonderful. So to answer Dawn's question, you've had bones in your freezer for like a long ass time. I wouldn't necessarily use them for anything that will cook for less than four hours. 
So if you're gonna be doing a long um, broth for those bones, uh, I would at least, you know, uh, cook them for four hours because, I mean, while there's no real chance of growing mold in the freezer, you're gonna get some of the smells from the freezer and to dissipate that, I would try to, you know, cook them for as long as possible. Um, if they're bare bones, um, you should roast them for about, I don't know, 10 minutes at like 450 degrees to brown off some of that stuff and uh, caramelize some of the fats that are still on the outside. Plus they taste better after you roast them. And then uh, make your bulalo and uh, go on from there. But if they're really meaty and really fatty, I would smell it first because fat can go off even in the freezer. Uh, so I would just check that. If it smells funky and like ammoniated, then and like, you know, it hurts your nose when you smell it, or um, it doesn't smell like a fresh, beefy smell, it starts to smell like your freezer, you probably don't wanna eat that. It's gonna, <laughs> your soup is gonna taste like the freezer. So uh, I would just check them. But sometimes they're like perfectly fine, because I've definitely cooked some questionable things from my freezer, because I live on the edge. <laughs> oh good, they're just bare bones. Oh, they'll be fine, cool. Um, great question. So Baby Castle says, I dreamed I was in a grocery store the other day and they had the hot sauce I wanted and I was so happy. Wait, does that mean that you didn't get the hot sauce that you wanted? What's the hot sauce that you wanted? Gosh, you know who can solve this problem? Uh, my friends at Heat Mist, they do mail order uh, hot sauce. Oh, Crystal. <laughs> I don't know if Heat Mist has Crystal, but <laughs> um, did you know you can make crystal at home. So um, a lot of backyard garden hot sauces uh, are made with vinegar and you can, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Baby Castle is freaking out in the chat. <laughs> so what you can do to make your own, your own hot sauce, everybody, let me tell you, uh, get some dried chili peppers, like, um, Thai chili pepper, ancho, guajillo, um, whatever it is. Um, you can either get dried or fresh. Uh, you s cut them up, stick them in a jar with like, you know, handful of salt, shake it around, let it sit at room temperature for a day to ferment, or two days if you wanna be risky and like, you know, whatever. <laughs> You'll get a more like funky sauce that way. But um, yeah, let it sit at room temperature for a day um, and then after that, you puree that with vinegar to thin it out as much as you want. And that's a hot sauce, guys. Like, that's it. It's chili pepper, salt, vinegar, mostly. And then anything else you add is just even better, right? Like garlic, paprika. Of course, you, yeah, you have a lot of salt in there already. It's fine. Um, but you could do like fruit juices. Um, yeah, tell me how that goes. Like, try making your own hot sauce. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. But if you're using, um, dried peppers, I would hydrate them first for 20 minutes in, like, hot water. So bring a pot of water to boil, stick in your chili peppers, and then let them steep like tea. And then drain that, and then do the salt jar thing over a day, and then make your hot sauce. Yeah, I, I can't wait for when we all get out of this like quarantine to hear what everybody's special skill is that you, <laughs> that you've mastered. Like for me, I've picked a really dumb one, which is skateboarding. <laughs> Cause my neighbors are gonna hate me. I've been like skateboarding across the living room at least once a day. Really sorry if you're watching. <laughs> but um, I discovered a skate park near my house too, so I'm, slowly getting confident about riding a skateboard, which is very exciting. Any other questions from the chat? How about you on Instagram? Do you guys have any questions? Hi. I love this two camera thing. I need like a moderator to like check both. <laughs> um, cool, you know what I'm gonna do? We're gonna take a quick like musical break. Um, let me know if it's too loud or not loud enough. 
um, so that I can drink some water and get a snack. Um, but I will be right back and I will answer your question, Don, when I, when I get back here. So let me put up this screen. BRB on Twitch, it says. Um, for you guys, I'm gonna move you this away to my keyboard. So be back in a couple seconds. I'm gonna play some Casio real quick. <laughs> do, 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 do. Okay. Let's see. Is that loud enough for you guys on Twitch? Or not loud enough? Let me know. I did not do tips for bulgur wheat yet. We will get there. Let's see. I'm going to keep this beat going. If you want me to change the rhythms, I can like change the settings on the Casio really quick. We'll go to like disco next. Cool. Let me figure out this really quick and then we'll get to the bulgur wheat question I'm sorry Okay, coming back to Twitch in a second. Instagram is watching me Google things. <laughs> Cool, cool. I'm gonna lower these beats here and come back to Twitch. Hi, I'm back. Did you see that fade? That was sick. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get to Dawn's question first, and then we'll join. We'll go to the bulgur wheat. Um, Dawn asks, um, "Have I ever made lumpia wrapper from scratch?" I have. And let me tell you, it is difficult. <laughs> um, I, it's a very simple recipe, but I think um, I don't have the right surface. It's kind of like making crepes. So if you're really good at making crepes, you can make your own lumpia wrapper. <laughs> um, it's a very sticky dough, and I've seen some YouTube videos of of people like. They have this dough in their hands and they're like kneading it simultaneously and then they slap it on this hot surface in a circle and then like peel it off very quickly. Yeah, the recipe looks really simple. It's just a matter of practicing the handling of it. It's a very difficult dough, which I think for me at this point, it's worth it to just buy the packaged Lumpia wrappers. Um, <laughs> because they, they freeze really well, they store really well. Um, but maybe I'll try to master that, you know? They don't have to be like the giant like square size. I could like make little ones and and see if I can make tiny lumpia myself. But that's a project to be tackled another time. 
Great question. Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, you know what I'm going to do on Twitch? I'm going to put an egg on me. Let's see. Got an egg. Got an egg in the Twitch. This is from my friend um, Rachel, who goes by Drip, D-R exclamation point P. Um, and she's a wonderful, wonderful Filipino pixel artist. Uh, who has a Twitch stream as well. So if you go to twitch.tv slash D-R-O-M-G-P, that's, that's her address. So please support Rachel, because Rachel's awesome and made my eggs. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about Boulder Wheat for Wes, uh, who requested it from the Instagram. Let's see... So, bulgur comes from Arabic for groats. <laughs> it's a cereal food. Um, they're made from cracked, parboiled groats of several different uh, wheat species. Sometimes they're not just durum wheat, they're other things. Uh, so, let's see. The way you cook it, it's usually 1.5 cups water to one cup of wheat. So bulgur wheat falls into the same category as rice, where, um, you know, if you want the groats, like the grains to cook um, separately and like not like a risotto, you know what I mean? Like there's this difference between grain cooking, like unbothered where it's individual grains and groats or like a risotto where it's more um, glutinous and and pasty because the more you move um, things like rice and bulgur in the pot um, the more it's going to release all that lovely starch from the inside of it <laughs> um, so just like rice bulgur you bring to a boil and then uh, fluff cover and uh, lower the heat so yeah that's how you cook it but uh, a lot of the time, it's also treated like oatmeal, where you could just put in a random, you know, more than the amount of groats that you put in the pot. Like you could put, I don't know, one cup or two cups or three cups of liquid and wait until it's all been absorbed. And then it has more of like a porridgey risotto sort of situation. Uh, so yeah, like you could just freestyle it and not have to measure anything if you don't really have measuring cups. Uh, you'll get more of like a, a soupy cereal -y type of texture. And what I love about these kinds of grains is not only can you have them in a sweet way, you know, with cinnamon sugar and honey and milk, you can also have them in a savory way. You can put olive oil, um, you can chop up garlic, you can throw pesto on top, or if you have um, tomato sauce, you can stir it in. Um, what else do I like? I like mushrooms and miso in, um, in savory oatmeal, so I think it would translate really well to bulgur. And before you cook any kind of grain, like bulgur, risotto, rice, any of those, uh, you could toast them in a tablespoon of olive oil on medium heat for like a couple minutes until you start to smell like this toastiness. And then you can like add your liquid, bring it to a boil and cook as, as you will. But I think the toasting step adds a little bit more dimension, which is really, really fun. Um, Martha Stewart says um, she loves bulgur in tabbouleh, which is a great salad-y uh, side dish. It's a high fiber, quick cooking grain. Great. She also has California style veggie burgers. Whoa. Yeah. So just as you could put black beans and rice and other grains into veggie burgers, you can use bulgur in there too. Woo. Wow. Cool. Learning so much. I hope that I have more uh, bulgur tips. So if anybody else has ideas of what to do with it. Um, yeah. Please let me know. Okay, I'm gonna switch. Okay, so do we want, 
disco or swing or a samba or a bossa nova. What do you guys want on my Casio? I'll just go disco. Let's go disco. Oh yeah. I like that. <laughs> Rad. Okay. So what has everybody been eating so far uh, uh, in quarantine? I'm really curious to hear what you've been eating. Uh, I made butternut squash risotto yesterday. It's a one of the first like TV recipes I learned on Food Network from uh, Giada, Giada De Laurentiis. Um, she has this cool trick of poaching the butternut squash in broth uh, as you are cooking risotto, because risotto takes forever, because you have to like put broth in and then stir it. Um, so while you're doing that, you can be poaching the butternut squash in broth. And then the, by the time you're done with the risotto, the squash is soft enough for you to put on top. So I love that. <laughs> okay, let's see. Dawn has been eating arroz cubana, beef calderata, pirate eyes. What are pirate eyes? Dawn, tell me what pirate eyes are. Um, miso soba noodles with veggies and stuff. That sounds so good. What are you all eating over there on Instagram? Tell me. All right, I'll get back to that in a second. Robert has a question on the Twitch. Grocery list, your grocery is all out of chicken. Do I have any fun, easy things I like to do with ground beef? Yo, okay. So yeah, if your grocery store is out of chicken, I feel you, <laughs> you need your protein. Um, glad you picked up beef. Um, I like to make taco mix in bulk. So the way that I do it is I put the ground beef in a pan and uh, start to saute it and break it up on medium heat. And you'll notice that it kind of clumps up a lot. And the way that you get it to break up like a Taco Bell, like really fine ground, is to like pour in a little water or beer and the liquid will help separate um, all the beef granules. So once the beef is like sauteed and um, no longer, what's the word, pink? Like when it turns, when you've browned it completely and there's no more like pink parts, um, this is when I start to season it really heavily. I do a lot of um, salt, cumin, paprika and powdered garlic. And that is pretty much like the Taco Bell like flavoring. So I like to have that on hand, you know, I can make tacos, I can make nachos, I can throw that onto like a casserole bake with like cheddar cheese. Um, so that's one easy thing I like to do with um, ground beef. But also there's meatballs, There you can make your own like beef sausage, like beef patties. Um, you can do burgers, you can do I don't know, what else? Stroganoff. I mean, that's usually like a more of a steaky thing, but you could do ground beef too. Yeah. Um, one of my other favorite uh, sort of meat balls is usually made with lamb, but it's called kibbe, K-I-B-B-E-H. And it's usually lamb, but um, you could do beef and then mix in um, like studs of rice like you know and and the rice soaks up like the beef and it's it's amazing <laughs> all kinds of meatballs uh cool so robert if you have any more beef questions feel free to dm me i will happily keep riffing keep telling you keep telling you some beef ideas um what else has everybody been eating so robert's been eating let's see other robert has been eating ribs bread roast chicken Ritz cracker chicken, yo, <laughs> migas, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, sweet potatoes, hell yeah. Carol's been eating a lot of salmon for dinner, bonzo with Italian sausage, lots of cauliflower crust, so she makes pizza for lunch, smoothies for breakfast with frozen fruits or whatever she has, uh, quick burritos or microwave nachos for lunch. Hell yeah, those are good ideas. Cool. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Everybody, I was on Matt's um, podcast this week, 
It's called Crash Chords Autographs. You can look at it on um, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find your podcasts. And, uh, yeah, we talk about creative life and the quarantine (laughs) and, you know, how, I don't know, how we're all getting through it. Um, I'm going to look at the questions on Instagram. Let's see what everybody has been saying here. What have you all been eating? You want to eat a pirate eye. Dawn, can you tell us what a pirate eye is and I will tell everyone else what it is? Oh! (laughs) Pirate eye is when you take a piece of bread, cut out a hole, and put an egg in it. And because... (laughs) There are so many names for this. Pirate eye, um... Toad in the hole, egg in a basket, a one-eyed Susan, eggy toast. And because you said egg, I'm going to add another egg to my screen on Twitch. If you're watching on Twitch, I have, like, eggs on my face. So this is an omelet by Drip. (laughs) All right, what else on Instagram here? Uh, you're in an apartment of 50 units and doing delivery cocktail service. You've been eating a lot of rice and beans, bowls with salsa, sour cream cheese, and seitan. Oh my god, that's amazing! A delivery cocktail service. I love that. That's such a good idea. I've been drinking gin and tonics. I'm almost out of tonics. I'm <laughs> like, uh-oh, am I gonna be like Lucille from Arrested Development? <laughs> Just start drinking straight gin? <laughs> Oh, speaking of more eggs, um, these earrings uh, are from my friend Malika. So if you're watching Malika, thank you. Got egg earrings. Cool. Um, She got them from this exhibit called Egg House. um, That was in the Lower East Side for a while. And uh, it was a lot like the Museum of Ice Cream, you know, these Instagram (laughs) museums. But, I mean, I'm very happy to have egg earrings. Really wonderful. Oh, it looks like my Instagram stream is going to end. Um, I guess there's a limitation to it. So if you're on Instagram, come on over to Twitch, twitch.tv slash jdillaveggs. Um, or you can look, search my name on, on Twitch and you'll find me. Or if you go to the Baby Castles Twitch, uh, they're hosting me as well. So come on over to Twitch. I'm going to end the Instagram one over here. Thanks for watching everybody over there. Um... Yeah. Cool. So we'll just focus here on Twitch. Uh, Do we have any more cooking questions? Yeah. Yeah. I'm loving this disco. I'm going to hit a fill on the... Listen. Yeah. Uh. (laughs) I love having Casio, like, on the table next to me. So funny. Um, okay, so I have a friend, Erica, who hit me up on Slack. Let's check it out. Eep. Okay, going to Slack. So I have many ways you can talk to me, so this is pretty amazing. So Erica asks, how do I cook with what I have instead of going to the store for specific ingredients for some big recipe, all caps? What I have right now is bulk grains, jars of condiments, cans of tuna, etc. How do I plan the timing and volume of cooking so I'm not sick of what I cooked, but also not spending two hours in my teeny kitchen every day? My goodness, let me say, Erica, I relate to this. This is pretty much my way of life right now. Um, And it's something I'm still thinking about and still figuring out. But on Patreon, I am starting a new column called Wasuremono, which is the Japanese word for things we've left behind. And so my goal for that column is to examine common and famous recipes um, for how many times we can make it by just, if we go to the grocery store for this recipe, how many times can I make that recipe with the ingredients that are that are present and then how much is left like you know if I have an eight pound bag of flour and I only needed four cups for this recipe what do I do to use up the rest of that flour so that's something that I really want to think about uh, as we're 
going through this together. Um, so if you have recipes that um, you're thinking of trying, um, I'm happy to examine them for you. Uh, but one of the first ones I'm going to tackle next week is Jim Leahy's No Need Bread that was made famous in the New York Times. Um, I'm not very good at baking bread. This was a great gateway recipe for me. Um, and it's really simple. It's flour, cornmeal, water, yeast. Um, what else can you use yeast for when you're not making bread? What else can you do with flour? Um, so those are the sorts of things I'm going to be talking about in this new Patreon column. So uh, join me there. It's going to be free. I'm going to share all my findings for free with everyone. I do appreciate people who subscribe, which is very helpful, and, you know, to help me buy all these ingredients and do it. But, but that's something that I'm going to work on in the long term. So Erica has lots of bulk grains. So bulk grains, we've talked a lot about lentils and bulgur wheat. Um, but there are so many ways to, to tackle them. So for grains in general, you can cook them as directed. You know, you're two to one or three to one, whatever ratio it is, um, and steam them, like bring it to a boil. Or you could do it the porridge way, which is way more liquid to the grain and stir it until they're done. You, you know, bite into it, see if it's done. If it tastes like starchy and hard, like it's not done. <laughs> um, but yeah, just having the, the done batch of it is just really helpful. Like just tossing into things and like eating a spoonful every now and then. Like I'm the kind of person who has a lot of done and finished dishes in my fridge and then I mix and match them. But when you embark on making large amounts of food like this, um, just kind of be aware how much you can eat or how much the people in your home can eat. Uh, because if it sits for too long, more than three or four days or up to a week, um, it can go off really quickly. So just be conscious of how much you're cooking at a time um, and know, be confident that you can finish it, you know. And if you can't, there are ways to save it before it even gets to that, like, rotten point. So a lot of the time when I, like, for example, I had a butternut squash. And I know for a fact one gen cannot finish a whole butternut squash in a week. So what I do is I meal prep half of it. So I take the butternut squash, peel it, cube it, and take half put that in the freezer so it's ready to boil or roast whatever it is I'm gonna do another time. And then I cook the first half for myself for this week. And let me tell you, I've only finished half of the halves. I've only eaten a quarter of a butternut squash and I'm already kind of sick of it. So note to self next time, put three quarters of the butternut squash in the freezer. <laughs> uh, it's gonna take me forever to get through my freezer. <laughs> Anyway, cans of tuna. So there's lots of fun things you can do with tuna besides making tuna salad. You can do tuna noodle casserole. You can make tuna cakes. Um, tuna cakes are, you know, you beat an egg, drain the tuna, mix it together, get some breadcrumbs, get another egg, dip it in the egg, well, dip it in some flour, then dip it in some egg, and then dip it in the egg again, put it in the breadcrumb, and then fry that. Um, what else about tuna? I'm trying to think. Oh, you can make tuna pate. You can um, drain the tuna, uh, whiz it in a food processor if you've got a mortar and pestle, beat it up with some butter, and then put it in a ramekin and pour melted butter on top of that, and that will keep for a week or so. Um, I like having pate-like things on dinner rolls. <laughs> That's kind of how I grew up. I grew up with like liverwurst on pandesal, which is delicious to me. Um, but tuna pate is also like along the same lines with that. What else? What else tuna things? Anyway, I'll think of more tuna things. Um, how to plan the timing and volume of cooking so I'm not sick of what I cooked, but also not spending two hours in the kitchen every day. Hi, Bijan! <laughs> I'm answering some questions from the chat and from a Slack and from Twitter. Um, I did talk about this a little bit already, but um, about timing and cooking. If you're not used to cooking every day like I am, 
I think it's a great gateway to meal prep on one day of the week. Uh, a lot of people like to spend Sundays. You know, it's a day of rest usually, but um, usually Sunday night is a good day to roast things. Um, if you've done your grocery shopping on Saturday and Sunday, Sunday night is perfect time to just turn the oven on 400 degrees and just start roasting hearty vegetables like potatoes, butternut squash, beets, carrots, and then having each of those pre-roasted vegetables available to you through the week to throw on a salad, put in a sandwich, chop up and put in a pasta. Um, that is one way to expedite you know, your daily cooking is to dedicate one afternoon or one evening to meal prep. So make a sauce, make a roast, um, do all the like tedious chopping and stuff on one day and then for the rest of the week you've shaved off like 30 minutes of cooking time, which is very exciting. Oh, Bijan, since you're here, I'm gonna put another egg on me. My friend made these pixel eggs. It's another egg. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I love these eggs. These are by my friend, Rachel, who also has a Twitch. Pixel egg. Um, how many of you have pixel sticker uh, on there? I've given it to some of you. It's from my Patreon, and um, I've already given away my last one. I wanna, I wanna do another run, but uh, maybe when we hit another Patreon goal. Oh, Don, it's on your ske sketchbook. <laughs> hey, Seven Bean Salad, who are you? I don't know who you are. Tell me who you are. Who is Seven Bean Salad? Oh, it's Martin. Hi. <laughs> Why is your name Seven Bean Salad on Twitch? <laughs> uh. <laughs> shut up, Carol. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't shut up. Um, thank you all for watching. Do we have any more um, cooking questions in the chat? I will happily answer them. We're about at one hour of streaming. Oh my gosh, you guys. I'm one hour of this is my first hour of twitch streaming on this channel so thank you for sticking with me um i have my casio beats in the corner <laughs> it's still daytime for you west coasters isn't it it's only 3 p.m for you it's already evening for me and the sun's going down and my light is changing but that's okay um just to give you uh behind the scenes this is my uh, light setup. I've got a desk lamp behind a bounce. And you can see my Instagram camera there. Instagram cuts you off after an hour, jerks. Um, <laughs> one of us, one of us, one of us. Thank you, Bijan. I am happy to be part of the Twitch family. Um... So Carol says, I suck at sauces. Do you have any go-to simple sauces that I make for chicken or fish? Um, this is a great question. Uh, I don't want to get into the mother sauces. I feel like that's too much right now. But honestly, like, I love a compound butter. Like, oh, Matt, thank you for hosting this channel. This is so nice of everybody for hosting. I really appreciate the amplification. Uh, hopefully we get some new people in here and help them. Anyway, uh, I love compound butter. I make so much compound butter. <laughs> Basically, it's flavored butters. Um, you take a stick of butter, leave it out at room temperature until it's like soft, you know, for, I don't know, two or three hours, depending on, on how cold it was. Um, and then from there, you put it in a bowl and mix in any fresh herbs, um, like two tablespoons of fresh herbs per stick of butter. So I like to do sage, thyme, and rosemary, but you could do just sage and garlic or just sage and thyme or just rosemary and garlic. But I do one clove of garlic, one stick of butter, and like maybe half a bunch of rosemary. And um, you stir it all together and then put it on a piece of like parchment paper or in a ramekin, put it in the freezer, 
and then uh, let it harden, and that is compound butter. You can put it on steaks. You can cook your chicken in it. Um, I wouldn't cook it for too long. Like, for so chicken and fish, like cut up chicken and thin fishes would be perfect for this uh, because fish is usually done in under 10 minutes. Uh, butter, you shouldn't really be scalding. You should be poaching with butter because um, you'll cook off all that lovely butter fat. Um, but I love compound butter for chicken and fish. Um, otherwise, I'll take sometimes uh, the end of a mustard jar and then um, pour in a little milk or heavy cream or uh, unsweetened almond milk or rice milk. Put on the lid and shake it up and you've made like a Dijon sauce basically. <laughs> So milk and uh, dairy products and mustard go well together. Um, and so from there, you can season it with some paprika uh, to make it more of like a chorizo flavor. You can add cumin for more of a taco flavor. Um, possibility, possibilities are endless. Um, you know, we, we also forget like mayo. I don't know how you feel about mayo, but... I don't know, for some reason in the 90s, mayo was so popular. Like, making a tartar sauce was my job at home when we were having fish sticks. So, like, mayo, a chopped up pickle, salt and pepper. Add a squirt of ketchup to make it special sauce or Thousand Island. Um, yeah. Like, that's, that's one of, like, my childhood, like, sauces that I've used a lot. Really good with fried stuff. And... When it comes to fried things, I have started leaning into not sauces, but more um, salts. So if you've ever been to Bozu in Williamsburg or um, what's the one in Bushwick? <laughs> what's the sushi place in Bushwick? I don't remember. If someone remembers in the chat. Well, anyway, these two sushi places they serve tempura. Momo. Yeah, Momo Shushi Shack. Thank you, Carol. Um, they serve tempura with matcha salt, um, which is amazing because when, when you pull things out of a fryer, um, they still have that oily sheen on the outside and salts, like flavored salts, stick right to them. So tempura or french fries or chicken tenders um, dipping into a matcha salt is so delicious. Wow. Um, or any kind of flavored salt, really, is so, so good. Um, where was I going with that? Salt, salt, salts. I swear I had, like, something else to say about it. I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, another condiment that's great for fried things or just as a side, um, is beets. <coughs> so if you've roasted beets or, um, pickled beets, you can like puree them into a relish and that is an excellent like side dish to fried things. It like really cuts the, the fat. Um, like they do that at Momo and Bozu too. They give you a little mound of like the matcha salt and then a little mound of beets to like cleanse your palate between bites. So very good. Very, very good. Does anyone else have any questions in the chat? I'm having a lot of fun with you. Thank you. I haven't really... Um, made a plan to cook things yet here because um, I have one electrical outlet that works on this side of the kitchen and the lighting over by my stove is not very good. So hopefully I'll work it in, like we'll actually cook things. Um, maybe next week I'll do the panini press because I'll, I'll be able to just have it next to me and like panini some sandwiches while I'm like talking. Um, that would be really fun. <laughs> But I also have to be super careful about how much food I'm making because I'm only one person and, um, you know, I don't eat very much <laughs> in general. So if I just make a roast, it'll be like here for weeks, you know. But anyway, um, I'm going to take a few more questions. I'm going to put another egg on me. Can you believe it? I have four eggs. This one's a good one. It's a poached egg. Ooh, typewriter tattoo asks, do you have any ideas for small savory snacks to make with cocktails? So many small savory snacks. Oh my goodness. Let's start with uh, one of my favorite bars that closed in the past, Booker and Dax. 
They made, uh, oh, vegetarian. Ah, you want vegetarian. Okay, we can do that. We can do that. Um, I guess what kind of cocktails are you making? Because you can go all over the place with this. You can make your own sort of snack mix. So you can get like, you know, oyster crackers and pretzels and nuts and mix them any which way you want. Ooh, margaritas and Manhattans. Hell yeah. I like the way you think. <laughs> um, going back to oyster crackers, um, saltines and oyster crackers, you know, they're pretty plain. I do kind of like snacking on them by themselves, but one really easy thing to do is melt some butter or get some olive oil and toss them, toss the saltines or oyster crackers in the olive oil or butter. And then um, get like some Old Bay or um, make taco seasoning or like ranch seasoning and toss them together. Like, you know, it's like you're making chicken tenders, but it's crackers. And then you um, set your oven to 250 degrees Fahrenheit um, and then spread the oyster crackers in a single layer on a baking sheet and then oven dry them for about 15 minutes. And so now you've made your own like flavored oyster crackers. So you can make your own like snack mix like you have your own bar at home uh, with those pretzels, nuts. Um, I'd throw in goldfish and Cheez-Its because I love Cheez-Its. Uh, but that's like one thing you can do. Um, another hack for like oyster crackers and crackers. How many of you have had chicken in a biscuit? <laughs> I love chicken in a biscuit. It's chicken bouillon flavored crackers. So you can do the same thing. Like I said, melt some butter, get top ramen chicken packets and mix it with the butter, toss the oyster crackers in it and then oven dry that at 250 uh, for 15 minutes. Oh great, Bijan moved me into the kitchen so you can listen while you can do dishes and make some food. Um, what other snacks? So vegetarian, I love um, cheese. I hope you like cheese too. But one of my favorite things to do is make a jar of marinated cheese. So you can get, um, you know, get a jar, drain some olives, um, roast some garlic, uh, get some feta cheese, cube it, stick it in there, and then um, add some red chili flake, fill it with oil, and you've got marinated feta for a while. You can do the same thing with mozzarella balls, or you can cut the mozzarella into um, cubes marinate it, do the same thing. Uh, or you can take goat cheese, roll it into balls, and then put it in the jar with olive oil, salt, pepper, red pepper flake, um, sprig of rosemary if you have it, bay leaf. Um, but that's something that will last for a while as long as you keep the cheese submerged in the oil. As soon as the cheese peaks above that oil, it's going to like grow something on it, so like, keep it submerged. Um, what else? What other bar snacks? Oh, roasted nuts are really easy. So most recipes for um, roasted almonds will tell you to mix an egg white into the almonds and then season it as you will and then roast at like 300 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but I learned that uh, garbanzo bean liquid or aquafaba is just as effective as white egg white when um, roasting nuts or um, baking. So that's another fun thing. <laughs> Speaking of beans, I would like you all to meet a few friends that I've made. Let's see. Um, I have this like crazy story that I wrote um, on Bijan's blog. It's called Indoor Voices. I can share the link later. But I have this saga of a case of beans that I didn't really want. <laughs> so I have a lot of beans, like bulk beans. I'm a caterer, so uh, I, I can order from Restaurant Depot and I have like these large cans. And I only ordered one and I got six for some reason and they're totally mislabeled. They're not actually garbanzo beans, but they're black beans. 
But I realize, you know, over the time that I've been spending at home, I've been alone, or not quite alone, because this is Bonzo. This is my friend, my companion Bonzo. He's like, you know, Wilson from... <laughs> He's like Wilson from, from Castaway. <laughs> Poor Tom Hanks. I hope he gets better. So along with Bonzo, I have Garbra. <laughs> Bonzo and Garbra are here to keep me company. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> They're so big and heavy. Anyway, these are my friends who have been keeping me company um, throughout quarantine. I'll, uh, no, I'll go on this side. Here we go. It's backwards, so I can't really tell. <laughs> I, I crack myself up. <laughs> They're gonna have another friend soon named Bea. Maybe next week I'll stream Bea. <laughs> oh, I had another question from Instagram. Someone, um, Elisa, was asking about frozen cranberries. Like, it's kind of miraculous that you have frozen cranberries at this time of year. They don't really emerge <laughs> until November, but you know what? Like, cool. <laughs> so I have a recipe on my blog for easy cranberry sauce. Um, it's not very hard to make cranberry sauce. <laughs> you stick the cranberries in a pot with the juice of an orange um, and a bunch of sugar and let it simmer until it become it releases all of its pectin and becomes like a jammy state. Um, but once I've made cranberry sauce, there are so many things from there that you can do. So you've done two things already. Um, You've made like a sauce that is spreadable. You can put it on sandwiches. Um, you've also made a simple syrup. So if you've never made simple syrup before, it's uh, one part water, one part sugar. You simmer it for just like two to five minutes to dissolve the sugar and then turn it off. So that's like a bartender's like secret weapon is making their own simple syrup. It's stupid easy. Don't ever buy it. So just remember one to one simple syrup. So when you make cranberry sauce, you've added enough sugar and enough water that kind of constitutes simple syrup. So cranberry sauce, if you thin it out a little bit more and strain it, is a cranberry simple syrup for making cocktails, making your own soda with seltzer. You can do um, like juice cocktails with like orange juice. You can make mimosas with it. So cranberry juice is you know, uh, it's good for your bladder. <laughs> it's really tart, you know. Um, you should be having, you should, you know, make sure you slot in your fruits and vegetables during quarantine so you don't get scurvy, you know, get your vitamin C. Um, but yeah, that's how you tackle frozen cranberries, at least how I would. I also have a recipe somewhere on my website for cranberry orange compound butter. So I've strained all that liquid out to make simple syrup, but I have all those solids that I can fold into a butter and then have on toast later, which is quite amazing. So yeah, cranberries go really well with oranges, so you know. All right. Say goodbye to Garbara. <laughs> okay, let's see. Does anyone else have any final questions in the chat before I hop off? I'm just really grateful for all of you who have been supporting me on Patreon and, you know, supporting the podcast that I'm on, Fun City. Um, if you haven't heard it, we play Shadowrun. Um, or we had been playing Shadowrun. We haven't been able to gather in a studio recently. But um, it's, it's fun. It's not like... I, I, I don't know, like a lot of D&D &D podcasts are like dice rolling and spreadsheets and things like that, but we are really character focused and I, I'm in love with the story that we're telling. It's set in New York City in the year 2101 and we basically are criminals 
but um, we have a lot of moral quandaries about what that means and what is good, what is bad, you know, all that. Oh, bye, Robert. Good to see you. <laughs> I hope you're making games and making cool music. Hopefully we can do a jam sometime. Um, anyway, yeah, Fun City is the podcast that I have, um, and it's been such a wonderful escape from or way to process our dystopian reality that's suddenly becoming more real every day. Ooh, that got dark. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you're not following me on social or like other things, you can scroll down um, below me here on Twitch and I have my Patreon linked, I have my website, my Instagram and all that. Um, so last call for questions. If you have a question, please put it in the chat and I'll uh, try to answer for you. Oh, so Bijan is doing dishes. Um, let me expound on the importance of doing your goddamn dishes. Uh, not doing your dishes well can food poison you, to be honest. Um, you gotta make sure that you have something rough or like a um, steel wool to get all of the you know, bits off of the substrate, you know? There's like solid food that gets stuck. And I get really nervous when people use gloves or, um, I mean, I get that you need to use gloves if you don't want your hands to get all like cut up and stuff. But um, I really recommend like feeling the dishes and making sure there's no stuck food there because when you put new food on top of it and you've eaten this old thing that may have touched soap or like older food and molds, like, you can make yourself sick. So please wash your dishes with hot water. Make sure you've gotten all the bits off. Um, soap it uh, and rinse it well. Let them air dry if you can. Um, if you don't have a lot of room and have to use a cloth to dry things, use a new cloth, you know, every time. Let that completely dry. Doing dishes is like the worst, but I feel like we're doing more and more dishes because we're cooking more at home. And so like, don't let that chore fall by the wayside. Um, David Reese, uh, who does that comic, Get Your War On. And um, he had a show called Going Deep. And he has a 30 minute episode about washing dishes. And I think it was like amazing. Yes, I've been avoiding Dish Mountain. Sometimes I can't help it after I, um, cater but I haven't been catering so I've been really on top of my dishes <laughs> um so everybody do your do your effing dishes ma'am god Brr. anyway that was my tirade about dishes so if you all have more questions for the next stream please tweet me or hit me up on Instagram or, or leave it in the chat here and I'll scour through and find it again. Um, but I'll be back next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, maybe I'll incorporate some cooking. Um, but yeah, I am so glad to do this and hope that it helped you in some way. Uh, so please call on me if you need cooking advice. And I will see you all next week, hopefully. So thanks for joining me. I'm going to play a little bit on the Casio before I go. Cool. Bye. Bye, everybody.